arguments from evil come in a variety of, of formats. One of those is the evidential, or it's sometimes called the inductive argument from evil. And here we'll look primarily at the way Timothy O'Connor presents this argument and his responses to the argument. In fact, there are three different versions that O'Connor presents, three different ways that people have presented this evidential argument from evil. One is to focus on a specific evil. So something occurs that is really horrible, maybe, and somebody says, because of that, it doesn't make sense for God exists. So the argument goes like this. There's no apparent reason that would justify God's permitting some particular evil, and then you, of course, identify the specific evil to occur. And so the specific evil might be, you know, you hear about a, a child being abused, for example, uh, something like that, that has happened that we're familiar with, and especially when it, this strikes uh, somebody personally, uh, this rationale might occur to them. And the idea is if God exists, there must be a reason for that kind of evil, but there doesn't seem to be a reason, therefore God doesn't exist. And of course, we've used words like apparent in the first premise, or seems to be, and so that's why it is an inductive argument that there is an element of probability here in the conclusion which I've made explicit in the way that I've written it here. Now, O'Connor responds to this version of an argument by saying, look, there might be a general broad reason to allow evils of a certain type that serve a greater purpose without having specific purposes for any given particular case of evil. Now, this is a little bit easier to accept if we're thinking of things that aren't so horrible, but are still evil. So, for example, rain. Suppose somebody has an outdoor wedding planned on a weekend in June, and it rains. Now, for that individual, right, there's, there's, they would say, why God, maybe, you know, it's so important to them, such a big day, and why God did you have it rain on this special day? Uh, but of course, there might there is a general reason to allow rain to occur, and that does serve a greater purpose. Obviously, a, a farmer may be saying, thank God for the rain, um, and there may not be any specific reason why it rained that day, or at that time, or at that location. Now, there are other versions, of course, of these arguments from evil. And O'Connor has other responses to that first form as well that we'll get to in a moment. So a second version is focusing on the amount of evil. Uh, sometimes it just seems overwhelming how much evil exists in the world. And so this argument says there is no apparent reason that would justify God's permitting so much evil to occur. And we have this is going to be a similar structure here with this second as well as the third that mirrors the first argument. If God exists, there must be a reason. And since there's no apparent reason, we conclude that God does not exist. Again, we've made the probability aspect of the argument evident by inserting it into our conclusion. Now, a third version, instead of focusing on a particular instance or the amount of evil, might focus on a particular type of evil or a kind of evil. And here we see the structure is going to be the same, except now we're focusing on types of evil. So there's no apparent reason that would justify God's permitting certain horrendous kinds of evil. Maybe, maybe uh, people being raped, for example. That's a horrible kind of evil. And so that kind of evil, God should just eliminate all of it. And if God exists, there must be a reason. But since there's no apparent reason, uh, God probably does not exist. Okay, so all three versions 
take that format. Now, a general approach that a, Timothy O'Connor takes is to say, well, when we are addressing an argument from evil, we have to keep in mind that the burden of proof is on the one proposing the argument from evil, right? They are the ones saying, here's a reason to believe that God doesn't exist. So for the person who believes that God exists, the particular beliefs are relevant. Now, as long as the claims are consistent with empirical data, right, broadly accepted information about the world, it's legitimate for an individual theist to appeal to their specific types of beliefs about God in order to respond to the argument from evil. Now, in particular, O'Connor is a Christian, and so he is saying that it's, it's perfectly legitimate for him to use Christian doctrine, Christian beliefs, as uh, a way of responding to the arguments from evil. Now, what O'Connor does is he, he doesn't try to say, here is the one specific kind of response for this argument, and maybe you have a different response for the second argument and a different response still for the third argument. What he does is provide multiple responses that are applicable to all three versions. And so we'll consider six of these different responses that O'Connor describes. First of all, there might be a perspective in which evil plays an important role that's simply unseen in a limited context. We have a limited context, and so our perspective doesn't have the view that God's perspective does, and so there might be a way that evil is playing a role in ways that we cannot see or cannot understand. So, like a moment of discord in a song, for example, that adds to the overall beauty of the song. Or a, a patch of ugly color in a painting. I have a, a Monet in my house, not an original, of course, a Monet print in my house. And if you just focus in on a little part of it, you know, it's just a splotch of, of, of brown painting that doesn't look very pleasant, but it adds to the overall uh, attractiveness of the painting. Or uh, I have a friend who makes quilts, and um, one time I went to visit her and her husband, and her husband had me come and see the quilt she was working on, and we go down, and I don't really have a great uh, capacity for an appreciation of quilts. It's not something that I developed, but I, I looked at what he was showing me, and it, it just looked like a tangled mess. I, I didn't understand. And then he flipped it over because I was looking at the underside of the quilt and uh, it just, it looked like chaos. When he flipped it over, I could appreciate the geometric patterns that were there. Some of the colors fit in together better. And so it made a lot more sense with that change in perspective. Another response that O'Connor has is that sometimes there are deeper goods that we could obtain only with some risk of suffering. And broadly speaking, this would fit in with the free will defense, the idea that God gives us free will and that allows us uh, responsibility. Uh, so being responsible for how the way the world turns out is a desirable good, but that's going to involve some risk. Free will, of course, uh, allows us to have uh, choose relationships, to choose to sacrifice for other people, and, and great goods, including love for God and love for others that could only be there uh, with that risk of suffering. So this would cover a wide variety of evils that exist in the world. A third response from O'Connor is that some suffering will be made up for in the afterlife. Now, we, in order to think of it this way, O'Connor says, again, appealing to his particular Christian beliefs that there is an afterlife. And for those who uh, know God and are Christians and follow God, there's going to be a great afterlife. And O'Connor says, look, we have to keep in mind what the ultimate good, the greatest good for a person is. And from a Christian perspective, 
that is fellowship with God, union with God. And so the suffering that may have prompted us to turn to God, for example, is worth it in the end to have that wonderful, great good uh, as a result. A fourth response is that some evils are going to be necessary for developing one's character, to develop virtue. So this is sometimes called the virtue defense. The idea here is you can't have compassion for another person unless that person suffers, right? Compassion doesn't make sense unless there's somebody suffering that you can comfort. You can't have courage unless there's actual danger to you, right? If, if you are experiencing no danger, it's not an act of courage. And, and so some of the evils that exist in the world are there so that we can develop these characters, characteristics that are valuable, I should say. A fifth response, and again, these are probably descending in order, generally speaking, um, that sometimes more dramatic or horrific evils help others see the folly of sin and the depths of their own sinfulness. So we may hear about, so for example, a drunk driver, um, somebody who was clearly drunk, got in a car, and then they caused an accident and killed a family of four for example, and, and little children were in the car and they were killed and the drunk driver survives. And we, we hear about that, what a horrific event, but on the, on, at the same time, some people hear a story of that and they think to themselves, you know, I, I've been negligent sometimes in the way that I've acted. Maybe I've, I've driven without being uh, careful with, with paying too much attention to my phone or or driving while extremely tired, or maybe even driving under the influence. And I've gotten away with it, so to speak. I didn't cause anything, but my goodness, I really need to shape up and not do that. I need to be much more careful and not put other people in danger. And so that can be a response sometimes when we hear about these things. A sixth response then is that generally speaking, some suffering on earth is going to be related to punishment for the fall, for humans, broadly speaking, and punishment individually for the freely chosen moral evils of humans. So sometimes we suffer consequences of our own bad decisions. Immoral choices that we make can cause problems for us and for other people. And again, this would go back to the free will defense and, and the, the risk that God takes. So this is connected in with the second response. Now again, it's O'Connor would never say that all evil is a result of one in you know any given individual's choice, the suffering that they experience is because of their own decisions. Of course not, but some of it might be. And so these responses are to be taken collectively, broadly speaking. And O'Connor's six responses are examples of theodicies. Now, they're not specifically designated to explain why a particular evil occurred, but they are examples of a theodicy. And a th theodicy is from two Greek words, uh, the theo meaning God and the the DK is the root for in the Greek, meaning uprightness or righteousness. It's defending the righteousness of God. It's providing some explanation for why God would allow evils to exist. So O'Connor has done that. He's provided some explanations why God might allow evil to exist. Now, there is another strategy uh, that some theists take. So I wanted to mention that just briefly while we're talking about the evidential argument. Another strategy is to question whether we should have find reasons for the evil that exists. And this might be related to that, uh, the concern about perspective, right? The, the first response that we had from O'Connor. Um, 
that we may not be able to see. So for example, sometimes we're simply not in a position to find something. So even if it's there, we're not in a good position to see it. So if you were wondering whether or not there are termites in your lawn uh, that might be looking for a tree to attack or your house to attack, so to speak, um, you can't just look out your window and then say, well, I don't see any termites, therefore termites don't exist, right? So we are limited and some uh, theists have responded by saying, we, we shouldn't think to, that we would be able to explain or know all the reasons that evil might exist. We're just not in a position to know that and so it's less of a theodicy trying to explain why evil is there and more of a defense, a defense which is trying to explain the consistency, the possibility that God exists and evil exists. 